We've all heard the story of the Salem witch trials, neighbors accusing neighbors of witchcraft, mass hysteria. If you're an American, you probably learned about it in school. Maybe you read The Crucible. But what if there was more to the story? A darker, more conspiratorial side. I'm King Trout. If that's something you'd like to hear about, take a seat and let me tell you the true story of America's first conspiracy. The Salem Witch Trials. <laughs> Let's start with some context. In 1628, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded primarily by... Those are, those are S's, it's Massachusetts. No, those are very clearly F's. No, but they're called a long passage. In 1628, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded primarily by Puritans from England. They were on a stock company charter to establish a financially viable colony on the new continent, and they were successful. Over the next few decades, there was a lot of political and religious upheaval in England, which caused a lot of people mainly Puritans, to flee to the New World for religious freedom. The Pilgrims, that we all learned about in school, were one of these Puritan groups. So in the 1500s, King Henry VIII kicked off the English Reformation. What this did was it converted the state religion of England from Catholicism to the Protestant Anglicanism. Whether or not he did this so he could get divorced is kind of up for debate, but probably yes. And the Puritans were a group of Protestant Christians who believed the Anglican Church was not different enough from Catholicism. Problem was, it was illegal to criticize the state religion, so they had to shut up and convert or leave. And some of them chose to leave. And most of those who fled England for this reason chose the colonies as their new home because it was culturally so similar to England and they could practice their religion freely. They were so devout in their faith and dedicated to practicing their religion that they packed up their life and moved to a new continent which at the time was the equivalent to essentially moving to a new planet. For these people, their religion was not a part of their life, it was their life. Remember that, it will come up again later. So religious exiles are trickling in across the Atlantic and establishing new settlements as they arrive on the continent. In 1626, Salem Town was one of these settlements. Ten years later, Salem Village popped up right next door. The people of Salem Town and Salem Village did not get along. And again, for these people, their religion was their life. And as such, church attendance was essentially socially mandatory. Miss a church service? Congratulations, outcast. Good luck surviving the winter in an era where your reliance upon your neighbors is almost mandatory. This was a problem because between the two communities, there was only one church, and the larger of the two, Salem Town. Now, since Salem Village and Salem Town did not get along with each other and had religious disagreements, in 1672, Salem Village voted that they would hire their own minister and start their own separate church. The first minister hired for the church in Salem Village was James Bailey in 1673. He was minister for six years before he quit because the villagers decided they didn't like his teachings and stopped paying him. His place as minister was taken over in 1680 by Reverend George Burroughs. Remember that name. He quit three years later because, surprise, the villagers stopped paying him. So the villagers didn't like these two ministers' teachings and stopped paying them. But why? It was because they were too soft. Not enough fire, brimstone, and fear. So in 1684, Diodat Lawson took over place as minister for Salem Village, but left four years later in 1688. Can you guess why? Did you guess it was because the people of Salem Village didn't like his teachings and stopped paying him? Wrong. Uh. Idiot. It was because of a technicality where the local parish hadn't officially ordained him. But, either way, on June 18, 1689, Reverend Samuel Parrish was hired to lead the congregation of Salem Village. Reverend Parrish brought that fire and brimstone the people of Salem Village wanted so badly. He was hardcore. He was always reminding his congregation of the constant battle everyone was waging internally against the devil. Make one little slip up and bing bang boom, there's your one-way ticket to hell, buddy. He was known for publicly ridiculing even the most devout members of his congregation for the teensy tiniest little infractions. And he also encouraged ratting on other members of the congregation who you thought were not fully following the church's teachings. Sure sounds like the healthy foundations of a community built on trust. What could go wrong? But some people in Salem Village thought this way of living kind of sucked. And so two years after he was taken on as minister, on October 16, 1691, the people of Salem Village got together and decided they were going to stop paying his wages and kick his ass out of town. It was kind of their thing. Uh oh Have I been calling him Parrish? Parrish. Parrish. His name was Paris. Samuel Paris. Like the city in France. I'm not redoing it. So now, Paris is minister for partial pay over a congregation who resents him. But he was going to stay because he was on a mission from God. Three months later, in January of 1692, things got interesting. That January, Reverend Paris's own nine-year-old daughter, Elizabeth Betty Paris, and his orphaned 11-year-old niece who lived with the family, 
Abigail Williams, started exhibiting strange behaviors. The girls screamed and threw things and made strange noises. Now, as a man with nieces in that age group, I would describe that as the standard bull that little girls do, but not Reverend Paris. He saw it for what it really was. The girls had been bewitched. <gasps> See, Reverend Paris had moved his family to be the minister of Salem Village in 1689, and he had moved from Boston. But just before he left, a prominent Puritan minister and Harvard graduate from Boston named Cotton Mather had published writings detailing exactly what the behaviors of those who'd been bewitched looked like. At the same time all this was going on, other girls began to exhibit symptoms of being bewitched. 12-year-old Ann Putnam Jr. and 17-year-old Elizabeth Hubbard. So Paris is convinced that the girls are bewitched based on the writings of Cotton Mather. And in Mather's writings, he states that witches will appear to those who've been bewitched, spectrally. Paris demands the girls tell him who bewitched them. Finally, after some questioning, they name Reverend Paris his own slave. A woman named Tichuba, or Tituba, or Tichuba. I've heard it pronounced all three ways, and there seems to be no rhyme or reason whatsoever. I will call her Tichuba. Now, pause. Here's the part in the story when modern sources will state that Paris beat a confession out of Tichuba, which is only half true. When Paris initially theorized that the girls were bewitched, some of the local women had the idea to bake a witch cake to find the culprit. A witch cake, and I'm not joking when I say this, is a cake made of rye flour and the afflicted party's urine, which would be baked and then fed to a dog. It was believed at this time that dogs had close ties to the occult and the devil, and if, after eating this cake containing the afflicted person's urine, the dog behaved bewitched, it would lead to the witch. So after consulting with some of the women in the village, Tichuba baked a witch cake with Betty's urine, which in and of itself was an act of witchcraft. Tichuba is confirmed to practice witchcraft. Now, ironically, by working with people who were kind of trying to help, but either way, she practiced witchcraft. Paris found this out, and then he beat Tichuba. He demanded that she confess to bewitching the girls, now that he had confirmed that she had already practiced witchcraft by baking the witch cake. Hmm. Not great PR to practice witchcraft as a means by which to exonerate yourself of an accusation of witchcraft, but hey, what do I know? It's worth noting that to these people at this time, witchcraft was real. The existence of witches and witchcraft was never in question. Witches are real, witchcraft is real, period. The only question at hand was determining who was a witch. And the other thing that's definitely worth noting once you put on your historical context hat and we start talking about these accusations is that the divide between correlation and causation had not yet really been examined. So if your neighbor approaches you and let's say they ask to borrow a loaf of bread and you tell your neighbor, sorry, I can't loan you a loaf of bread. If I do, my family might starve. And your neighbor says, well, I hope horrible things happen to you. And then a week later, something horrible happens to you. Sure sounds a lot like they caused that. We've got all of that brewing in a village where the minister has worked very hard to develop a cult of fear and accusation when nobody even liked each other to begin with. And now his own daughter is bewitched. If the devil can make his way into the minister's house, it could be anywhere. Tichibo was interrogated and confessed to convening with the devil. She stated there were three others at this meeting. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and a tall man she didn't recognize. She said she was coaxed by Good and Osborne to write her name in the Devil's Great Book. And she did. And when she did, she saw Osborne and Good's name, along with six others that she couldn't quite make out. Both of the Sarahs who were named were social outcasts and neither was very active in the church, likely targets for a witchcraft accusation, and, using the logic of a 17th century Puritan, likely practitioners of witchcraft. And so in March of 1692, Tichuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne were all jailed and held for trial. So obviously the fact that there are three witches in the village, and at least six more who we don't know who they are, was the juiciest piece of hot freaking goss. Everybody in the village had their focus entirely on what these girls would say next. So at this point in time, the girls have accused three people of witchcraft, but why would they accuse them? Well, there's a couple theories on that. One of these theories is one of those, like, historical facts people will throw out having never researched it whatsoever just to sound like they're more intelligent and more well-read than the average person is. And that is the theory of convulsive ergotism. Convulsive ergotism is a poisoning caused by a fungus, ergot, which grows on certain cereal grains. This theory states that the girls were suffering from convulsive ergotism probably due to bread that they had eaten, causing the symptoms that appeared as if they were bewitched. This theory gained traction after an article was published in Science Magazine in 1967. Now, the reason 
I think that it caught on is because one of the chemicals produced by the ergot fungus is lysergic acid, LSD. So it's the 1970s, somebody throws out a theory that, hey, all these girls were acting the way they were acting because they were high on LSD, man. It was hip, it was trendy, it sounded cool, and that took off. Some people take issue with this theory, including me, for a multitude of reasons. One, if it was ergot poisoning, everyone in the house would have suffered from it. Two, if there was ergot within the village, in all likelihood, the entire village would have suffered from ergot poisoning. And three, uh, you can't turn convulsive ergotism on and off. See, the girls would act bewitched suspiciously when it was convenient for them. So, in my opinion and based on my research, the theory of convulsive ergotism is horse Another theory is that these girls were expressing their traumas. They had these internalized problems that they were letting out. You know, it was uh, psychosomatic, the symptoms of years of abuse that were finally being released, which also is just horse this is just some touchy-feely nonsense that people use to excuse the consequences of the girl's actions. The real reason for their actions. What was the real reason for the girl's actions? Well, based on all of my research, in my opinion, it was one of two things, but probably both. Try and imagine, and this will be harder for some of you than others, that you are a preteen girl in a 17th century puritanical village in New England. The expectation for your behavior is that you be silent and unseen doing your chores, never speaking unless spoken to. And now, all of a sudden, everybody's paying attention to you, hanging on to your every word. All of a sudden, these girls were the center of everyone's attention. And they were kids, so at the time, they were too dumb to realize that their actions had consequences. Now, another factor that I'm fairly certain was at play in their behavior and making these accusations was uh, outside influence, particularly in the case of Anne Putnam Jr. Nearly everyone she accused was either a direct enemy of her family or their removal from society was incredibly beneficial to her family. In March of 1692, the girls accused four more of witchcraft. Among these was a four-year-old, Dorcas... <coughs> Dorcas... <coughs> four-year-old Dorcas Good... <coughs> four-year-old Dorcas Good, Sarah Good's daughter, and an elderly woman, Martha Corey, who was a devout and well-respected member of the church. Why would they accuse a four-year-old of witchcraft? Well, it may have been because they used the testimony of the four-year-old to help convict her mother. Why would they accuse a devout and well-respected member of the church? That may have been because Martha Corey was in staunch opposition to the accusations of witchcraft and claimed that the girls were making it all up shortly before she was accused. Hmm. The bewitched girls were also joined by a new accuser, 17-year-old Mary Warren. She was a servant girl for a local family, the Proctors, and accused her mistress, Elizabeth Proctor, of witchcraft. The accusations compounded in April of 1692. Sarah Cloyce, sister to a woman who'd been accused of witchcraft the previous month, came to her sister's defense and was in turn accused of witchcraft. John Proctor, Elizabeth Proctor's husband, came to her defense and was in turn accused of witchcraft. Giles Corey, Martha Corey's husband, rebuked the claims made against his wife and was in turn accused of witchcraft. Abigail Hobbs, a girl who was conveniently the same age as the girls who were bewitched, was accused of witchcraft, and in turn, so were her parents. Bridget Bishop, a woman known for her scornful dislike of children, was accused by the girls of being a witch. That same month, Mary Warren, the servant girl who had accused her master of witchcraft, came forward and said she was lying. She made it all up, and the other girls were lying too. She was accused of witchcraft. Have you started noticing a pattern? And the final person accused of witchcraft by the girls in April of 1692 was the former minister of Salem Village, George Burroughs. It might be worth noting that Reverend Burroughs owed a lot of money to the family of the girl who accused him of witchcraft. Hmm. The accusations of witchcraft were stuck in a positive feedback loop. The girls would accuse somebody who'd inconvenienced them or their family or they didn't like or who had called them a liar and then someone would step up to defend that person and they would be accused of being a witch and the cycle would continue. In February, when it all started, there were three accusations of witchcraft. In March, five. And by April, 23. People who were accused would be taken in for questioning, generally at hearings that were public, so it was a spectacle for the village, and the girls got to put on a show. Well, it was determined that there were two ways to get a conviction of witchcraft. Either A, the accused confesses to practicing witchcraft, or B, there are two eyewitnesses to the accused practicing witchcraft. Remember earlier when I mentioned that the writings of Cotton Mather that Paris had read stated that witches could appear to the afflicted spectrally? The courts decided to accept spectral evidence 
And what this meant was all it took for someone to be found guilty of witchcraft was for two people, let's say, hmm, hypothetically, I don't know, two young girls, to say that they were witnessing spectral visions as performed by the accused. The girls would make an accusation at whoever they wanted. It would be taken to court. They'd back it up with their bold and spectral visions. That'd be seen as enough for a guilty charge. And if anybody questioned it, they'd accuse them. The cycle repeats. While all of this was happening in New England, back in Old England, there was yet another royal upheaval, new king. I'm not going to get into the technicalities because it's English history, so who cares? But long story short, there was a slight lapse in the provincial government because there was a change in kings. The new king had appointed a new governor for Massachusetts. The man chosen by the new king to be the governor was William Phipps. He was chosen by the king at the personal recommendation of the president of Harvard at the time, Increase Mather. Increase Mather was the father of Cotton Mather, the man who had published the writings on the behavior of the bewitched and spectral visions. Yes, that's right. A man named Increase had a son, and he named him Cotton. But that's beside the point. In all likelihood, Phipp was chosen by Mather to be something of a puppet. Phipp had essentially no experience in politics. Really, the only thing he was known for was being a treasure hunter. He had discovered a sunken Spanish galleon and all the gold aboard. Which is actually, that's cool as f***. Phipp had been in London with Increase Mather to receive the appointment, and the two returned to Boston, Massachusetts in 1692. Immediately after arriving in Massachusetts, Phipp became very interested in the witch trials, word of which was spreading around the colony. In the three short months leading up to his return from London, 31 people had already been accused of witchcraft in the small village. In May of 1692, the month of Phipps' return to Massachusetts, he created a court of Oyer and Terminer, which is some fancy-schmancy legal term that I'm not going to be bothered to look up, But essentially, he was creating a legitimate court to try these accused witches. Phipp appointed his deputy governor, William Stoughton, as chief justice of this court, as well as eight others. The other eight judges he appointed, whose names I can't be bothered to remember, were Samuel Sewell, Waite Winthrop, John Hawthorne, John Richards, Peter Sargent, Bartholomew Gedney, Thomas Danforth, and Nathaniel Stallinstall. Phipp claimed he chose the nine best suited for the job, which may have been the case, but in all likelihood, he probably received a little bit of helpful suggestion. Of the nine judges chosen, five of them attended Harvard, again, where Increase Mather was president, and six were related through marriage. It was now the tail end of May 1692, the court has been established, and in the meantime, 36 more people have been accused of witchcraft. But now that there's a court, legitimate trials can begin. Up till now, all the trials had been civil trials. It was more a court of public opinion type thing. People had been jailed, but no one was convicted of anything criminally, nor was anyone sentenced to anything. That was all about to change with the new court. On June 8th of that year, a law was brought back which allowed for the hangings of those convicted of witchcraft. Coincidentally, the first trial by this court occurred on June 8th. Bridget Bishop, a woman accused by the girls of witchcraft in April, had been found guilty of witchcraft based on the spectral evidence provided by the girls. She was sentenced to death. Just two days later, on June 10th, Bridget Bishop was hanged. Sidebar, hanging at this point in time was a very different punishment than what you're probably thinking of hanging as. You see, at this point in time, the goal was not to snap the victim's neck as it became. They strangled people. They would take a ladder to a tree and have the person sentenced to death climb the ladder, tie a noose around their neck, tie it to a branch, and then they would turn them off the ladder, as they call it, an acute euphemism. Uh, They would push them off the ladder, and then they would slowly strangle to death. Immediately following the conviction and execution of Bridget Bishop, Judge Nathaniel Stallinstall quit the court on the grounds that he didn't agree that spectral evidence should be admitted. He thought it was f***ing stupid that they had convicted and executed a woman who may have been innocent based on the allegations that little girls had seen visions she was creating. Truly a man ahead of his time. His position on the court was filled by Judge Jonathan Corwin, who was brother-in-law to Judge John Hawthorne and uncle to the county sheriff. The county sheriff who, mind you, had been taking the property of those who were accused prior to a conviction and wouldn't give it back, even if they were found innocent. Right around this time, a few of those who'd been accused and were awaiting trial died in jail. Increase Mather wrote a letter to the court urging them to speed up the rate at which the trials were happening and recommending they maybe don't use spectral evidence to convict people and execute them. They listened to half of his advice. The court picked up the pace as the accusations continued to roll in. On July 19th of 1692, five more who'd been found guilty of witchcraft were hanged. Exactly one month later, on August 19th, five more were scheduled to be hanged. Among them was Reverend George Burroughs, former reverend of the village of Salem. Increase Mather had come down from Boston to be in attendance of the hangings. Reverend Burroughs was the first scheduled to be hanged on that day. He had refused to make a plea of innocence or guilt because it was not a trial with a jury. 
And I know people always make that stupid joke where they're like, oh, well, if, if they're a witch, then they'll free themselves, but if they're not a witch, then they'll die. Uh -huh. All right, you have to put yourself in the historical context. So let's say, hypothetically, you're not a witch, and you've been accused by a bunch of little girls of being a witch, and you're put on trial, and they all pretend that they're seeing visions you're causing, which is grounds for you to be found guilty of witchcraft. You have two options at this point. You could do what some did and lie and confess to being a witch on the grounds that maybe you could name other witches, which again falls into that problem of how things are spreading like a virus, but you'll at least be alive for a little bit longer, hopefully. Or you can do what many others did, be accused of witchcraft and stand by your convictions and tell the truth. Because to you and how real your faith is to you, lying will send you to hell for all eternity. So you can die telling the truth while being accused of being a witch and you get to go to heaven. Or you could lie to save your ass temporarily and accuse others of being witches, which you may or may not believe to be the truth, but you have lied in admitting to something that you are not, which is a one-way ticket to hell because lying is a cardinal sin. So for many of these people, being accused of being a witch and sticking to your guns and telling the truth up until you were killed was a better option, because at least that way you get to go to heaven. So Reverend Burroughs was first on the list to be hanged, and as his last words, he said the Lord's Prayer, something that was thought to be impossible by witches. People were stunned. They were moved to tears. They took a step back, and they thought, whoa, what have we been doing? This is insane. We're listening to the visions of these little girls, and we're taking that to be the truth, and we're, we're about to hang a man who was the pastor for our village. We're, who are we? What separates us from animals? Really, we're, we're supposed to be made in God's image, but here we are, acting so savagely. Are we the demons? Are we the ones possessed? But then, Increase Mather chimed in. He said, I don't know, guys. That was pretty good. Almost too good. Sounds like the work of the devil to me. So they hung Reverend Burroughs and the four others. A month later, on September 17th, Giles Corey, the husband of the devout Martha Corey, who'd been accused a few months prior, was questioned. The court wanted a confession out of him, but he was smart enough to realize if he claimed to be guilty, he would be executed, and if he claimed to be innocent, the girls would claim he was guilty, and he would be executed. But on a weird legal technicality, if he made no plea, then his inheritance could be passed on to his children. So in order to get the answer out of him, the court ordered that he be pressed. Pressing is when a person is laid flat on a board with another board placed on top of them. Weight is then slowly added onto the top board, increasing the amount of pressure that's felt on the individual until the desired result is achieved. In this case, the desired result was an admission of either innocence or guilt, but Corey recognized he was going to be killed either way. But with that technicality, if he made no claim of innocence or guilt, his inheritance could be passed on. The county sheriff was in charge of overseeing the procedure. He would show up regularly to add stones, increasing the amount of pressure felt on Corey. He would then ask Corey how he pled, guilty or not guilty. And each time, Giles Corey would respond the same. More weight. I'm guessing Giles Corey was able to handle a pretty significant amount of weight since he had to lug around those giant f***ing balls. Unfortunately, after two days, he did succumb to the pressing and died. Just three days after Giles Corey died from pressing, eight more were hanged for witchcraft, one of whom was his wife, Martha Corey, the woman he had stepped forward to defend. So it's late September of 1692, and 139 people have been accused of witchcraft so far. 20 have been executed, 19 by hanging and one by pressing, and four others have died in jail. But then, one person got accused, and everything came to a grinding halt. Mary Spencer Hall is accused of and arrested for witchcraft. So you're probably asking, who the hell was Mary Spencer Hall? Why did everything come to a grinding halt when she was accused? Well, Mary Spencer Hall was the wife of Governor William Phipp. You see, the trials and executions that were happening under his governorship that he had more or less directly set up they were totally fine until they hit too close to home. On October the 12th of 1692, Governor Phipps put an end to the trials. Shortly thereafter, on October 29th, Phipps prohibited the arrest of anyone accused of witchcraft, released many of those who'd been accused, including his wife, shocking, dissolved the court, and prohibited 
any writings or publications be made about the trials. The father-son duo of Increase and Cotton Mather were pissed that Phipp had put an end to these trials. In their mind, he was letting the devil run rampant through Massachusetts. And he had bitten the hand that fed him. William Stoughton, who, if you remember, was the chief justice of the court before it was dissolved, and Phipps' deputy governor, issued an order. He ordered that all suspected witches whose executions had been put on hold due to pregnancy be executed immediately, of which there were a few in Salem. Phipp, 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 Phipp. In protest of his order being denied by the governor, Stoughton resigned as a judge. Super coincidentally, and I'm sure entirely unrelated, shortly after all this went down, Phipps was accused of misappropriating funds, removed as governor, and shipped to England for trial. Stoughton took his place as governor. Hmm. Just as quickly as it began, it was all over. No more accusations of witchcraft, no more trials, no more hangings. Miraculously, all of the girls who'd been bewitched were instantaneously cured when it was illegal to accuse someone of witchcraft. It's crazy how that works. It's almost like they just fucking made it all up. People took the ban on publishing anything speaking out against the trials seriously. Nobody said anything for three years until Thomas Maul tried his luck and wrote a booklet talking about the Massachusetts government's role in the trials and criticizing them. And for bravely speaking out about this miscarriage of justice, all of his books were seized and burned and he was imprisoned for 12 months. A few years later, in 1702, the general court found that the trials of 1692 were illegal, which isn't of much use to you if you're dead, but petitions were filed by those who'd been accused asking that their names be cleared and shortly after they were. Some of them. In 1706, Anne Putnam Jr., now an adult and recognizing the consequences of her actions, publicly apologized for her role in the Salem Witch Trials. In 1711, the General Court passed a bill restoring the rights and good names of those who'd been accused. Some of the family members of those accused didn't want their names to be listed, though. As such, they weren't. Over 250 years later, in 1957, the legislature of Massachusetts apologized for the events of 1692. This apology was amended in 2001 to exonerate those who had not been specifically named. On October 31st, 2001. Get it? Halloween? It's cute, right? Publicly apologizing for executing people who were wrongfully accused of witchcraft, but it's gotta be on Halloween because that's cute. So here we are, 330 years later, looking back, what can we learn from the Salem witch trials? Obviously, innocence until you're proven guilty is incredibly important, and knowing that someone is guilty of a crime beyond a shadow of a doubt before they're convicted is incredibly important. As Cotton Mather eventually said, it's better that a hundred witches go free than one innocent person be executed as a witch. And also, don't trust the belief in someone's innocence or guilt on a bunch of bullshit made up by little girls. What the fuck? What the 20, these little girls killed 20 fucking people. Look, it's directly their fault. I mean, there were other people involved, but those people are dead because of those little girls. And finally, will it happen again, or have we learned our lesson? Well, I mean, we probably won't, like, literally accuse each other of being witches, but of course it'll happen again. It's, it's literally a turn of phrase now. You can say that somebody's on a witch hunt when they're doing exactly this shit, because it happens so often that we just put it in the dictionary. No, we're never going to learn our lesson. We're human beings. This is the type of shit we do all the time. All the time. But either way, I hope you enjoyed that. You've made it all the way to the end. Again, I've been King Trout. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. You can find me on kingtroutcomedy.com. Uh, you know, like, share, comment, subscribe. It helps the algorithm. I could be the guy who's like too cool for that. It's like, oh, you're going to do what you're going to do. No, it genuinely is truly helpful to me. So, um, you know, I'm on TikTok, Instagram. Again, kingtroutcomedy.com. I'll link everywhere or whatever. Thanks for hanging out. I hope you enjoyed it. Fip. Fip.